Hi there, I'm the Mythkeeper. Welcome back to my channel. This week I'm doing another creature feature. This was the third one in my series. So I've done giants, I've done hags, and this time, instead of doing a single creature, I'm doing eight different creature types. So this is a little bit of a longer video uh, for this series anyway. Uh, but I think it's a lot of fun. It's a bunch of classic D&D monsters that have been with the game from pretty much the earliest edition of the game and have been sort of reinvented in subtle ways for the Pathfinder game. I think there's some really great content here. Enjoy. In this video, I'm going to take a look at the Pathfinder take on some classic and iconic monsters from fantasy role-playing, tabletop games, and video games. Many of these are old-school Dungeons & Dragons monsters revamped and revisited for today. Some of these monsters come from the first edition Classic Monsters Revisited sourcebook, but not all of them are from there because some of those monsters I tackle elsewhere, goblins are discussed in my Ancestry Guide video on the small folk, and orcs have gotten a whole video of their own. Hobgoblins, lizard folk, kobolds, they've also all gotten their own videos. So I've taken some of those monsters and a collection of other monsters that I think are either fantasy staples or have sort of become fantasy staples, and discuss them in a little more detail today. Before I detail which one those are, though, I think it's worth hearing from Paizo Publishing a little bit about their design choices when it comes to taking on these classic monsters. In Classic Monsters Revisited, James Jacobs said the following in his introduction. Our goal here was not to reinvent these monsters, as much as to re-envision them. In most cases, these monsters were harvested from real-world myth, and that became a primary stop in each monster's research stage. But each of these monsters has also been in every edition of the game. We went back to our well-loved first edition monster manuals and mined each monster entry for tidbits, working our way up to the current edition and doing our best to assimilate all the information. The driving goal was to capture what it was that made these monsters so popular that they remained cornerstones for 30-some years, but at the same time excise the parts that turned them into cliches or made them boring. A daunting task, certainly, but one that our authors rose to the challenge of meeting. Hopefully you'll see some of those efforts in play here as we cover eight new creature types in our creature feature today. Bugbears, the largest and most fearsome of the goblinoid tribes. Ettins, two-headed degenerate giants who sometimes bully orcs or goblins into serving them. Gnolls, humanoid hyena people who can be found all over Galarian. Harpies, winged avian creatures who terrorize the high peaks and temperate woodlands where they dwell. Minotaurs, large humanoid bulls with keen minds for mazes and labyrinths. Ogres, which were much requested after my giants video, half-giant monsters that lurk on the fringes of society, bringing terror and violence to any settlements in the vicinity. Sahagans, scaly, fishy humanoids that seem to make an appearance every time your adventuring party goes near a river, lake, or ocean. And trolls, lumbering giants with a unique ability to recover from even grievous injuries very quickly, as their flesh and organs self-repair at a greatly accelerated rate. Bugbear. In the context of real-world mythology, a bugbear is a type of hobgoblin, or folkloric creature, that was used in various proto-European cultures to scare disobedient children. The term bugbear is believed to have originated from the Middle English word bug, meaning a frightening thing, or from the Old Welsh word boog, meaning an evil spirit or goblin. The English words boogeyman and bugaboo are probably cognates of this term as well. The distinct pathfinder creatures of the Babao, Bogard, Boogeyman, and even the Kukui all stem from the same essential root mythology. During medieval times in England, the bugbear was often depicted as a sinister bear that roamed the woods frightening children. The creature was not unique to England either, in fact, although that word is etymologically very Anglican. The author Antonio Francesco Grazzini, from the Republic of Florence, published a prose comedy in 1561 called La Spiritata, which was adapted to English as the stage play called The Bugbears by an unknown author and performed in England in the late 1560s. The Italian bugbears in this play had similar descriptions to their English counterparts. Bugbears embody the fears of the unknown lurking in the darkness. They are the monsters that children believe are hiding in their closets, tormenting them, yet evading detection when parents swing open their doors. In the night, they lurk beneath windows, listening to people sleep and feeding on their nightmares. Fear of the night is a common experience among people, and bugbears are an embodiment of this universal dread. In the Pathfinder world, the main way in which it ties back to this original source material is in their ability to literally smell fear. It's not a fey creature, however. That more explicit type is called the boogeyman. Instead, like the D&D roots it takes its cues from, it's a biological creature native to the material world, and is in fact the largest of the goblinoid types. Goblinoids are a family of related humanoid races. Though varied in form, all goblinoids have certain traits in common, notably sharp, pointed ears, a shared language, a lifestyle of hunting and raiding, and an aptitude for stealth. There are three main types of goblinoids in Galarian, goblins, hobgoblins, and bugbears. 
Goblins, along with their northern, southern, and eastern cousins, the snow goblins, monkey goblins, and kijimuna, respectively, are by far the smallest varietals. There is also an aquatic varietal of goblin known as the grindylo as well. All of these subspecies tend to be around three feet tall with large flat heads and long ears. Goblins are the oldest and original goblinoid species, said to have been created by the Bargast hero gods Hadragesh, Venkelvor, Zarangel, and Zogmagot during the Age of Creation, something which I discuss in more detail elsewhere in my videos. Hobgoblins look like goblins, but stretched out to the height of a human, lean and muscular, and they tend to live in the most sophisticated and advanced communities of all the goblinoid brethren. The origin of the hobgoblins lies far back in the Age of Legend. An unknown party, but possibly the long-lost cult of the devil Kenzoriant, created the hobgoblins by enhancing regular goblins with greater size, stamina, and mental faculties through the use of a powerful artifact called the Kentorian Spring. They were created for one purpose only— war against the hated enemy of their creators, the elves. In the 20,000 plus years since the first hobgoblins were created, though, they have long since evolved past their original purpose. A bugbear instead looks like a hobgoblin that was given an extra foot of height and then stretched broadways. They are hulking creatures, often reaching up to 7 feet in height and weighing up to 400 pounds. It's also the hairiest goblin, with short, dark fur spread all across its powerful hulking frame. Its large ears hang loosely from its skull, and like other goblinoids, they tend to have oversized teeth and ears. Although the largest of the goblinoids, the bugbear is not an evolutionary offshoot of the hobgoblin. Most scholars believe that the bugbear is a distinct separate branch of the evolutionary tree, emerging directly from the original smaller goblins. This is consistent with bugbear's own storytelling of their history. Bugbear legend tells of the first bugbears, born to goblin parents, that emerged from the womb covered in shaggy fur. They soon proved far different from their kin, delighting and terrorizing other children, and eventually murdering several members of the tribe until they were cast out to wander aimlessly forever alone. If there's truth to these legends, then it's possible that it was a fluke mutation, or that the original bugbears were hybrid creatures, perhaps an unlikely crossing of an ogre or hill giant with a goblin, or my personal favorite theory that the original bugbears might have been hag-born changeling children. This could explain the almost supernatural stealthiness some of them possess, and give them a tie back to the fey world from which the real-world mythology of these creatures springs from. Despite their size, bugbears are incredibly stealthy, and they use this to their advantage by playing mind games, causing bumps and noises in the night, and opening doors and windows and settlements. The bugbear's most disturbing ability, however, is their capacity to literally smell fear. Bugbears smell the fear of living creatures more strongly than anything else, and they find it intoxicating. For a bugbear, the hunt is a narcotic experience. Because of this, they rarely strike at a victim undetected, because then the victim has no fear for the coming end. Rather, they will build their approach slowly, so that their appearance is as frightening as it can be before they strike. Bugbears have been known to enhance their ability to smell fear by using local herbs and flora. They have a particular fondness for a thorny weed called Tomb Herald, so named because it is often found near burial sites, which serves this precise purpose. When the bramble is fermented into a spirit, its potency significantly increases. During a hunt, if a bugbear drinks the resulting beverage, known as bramble sick brandy, the smell of fear will drive them into a wild rage as they hack apart their victims in a state of near ecstasy. The brandy does also, however, cause nausea and a very painful hangover the day after its consumption but this is something that many bugbears are willing to tolerate in exchange for its perceived benefits during the hunt. More than a few adventurers have had the fortune of encountering a raid of bugbears after a night of indulging in bramblesick and found their opponents to be vulnerable and easy to defeat. Bugbears have a naturally short lifespan, and like goblins, they reach physical maturity in just five years. Young bugbears grow so quickly that they are often racked with growing pains, something which only serves to further sour their already unpleasant nature. Although goblinoids can live for about 50 years, as bugbears lead violent existences in which they claim hundreds of other lives, they usually die long before they reach old age. Bugbears do not form traditional families or raise offspring to remember their hunts or exploits. Instead, they use brutal self-inflicted scars on their skins to record the stories of their lives. These scars have no recognizable pattern to outsiders, but other bugbears can easily interpret them. When choosing mates, bugbears base their decision on the tale of great hunts depicted in these scars, selecting strong and capable partners to ensure their offspring are skilled hunters capable of surviving abandonment at a young age. Unlike goblins who breed prolifically, bugbears tend to focus on other matters. They only breed a few times in their lives and tend to be reclusive, even when living and hunting in groups. When they do procreate, bugbears often give birth to twins or triplets. 
Although bugbears are capable of carrying multiple young, the birthing process is often difficult and dangerous, particularly as the number of offspring increases. Though tragically commonplace, a mother's death during delivery does not hinder her offspring, who are intuitively capable of fighting their way into the world, even under the most challenging circumstances. Bugbear young are impressively self-sufficient, and as they grow older, the weak are culled by their own siblings through ruthless games of sibling rivalries. The result is that bugbears who survive their pitiless childhoods are ruthless specimens, devoid of fear or mercy. By nature, bugbears are wanderers and tend to keep to themselves, making them the outcasts of goblin kind. They roam the wilderness, traveling from town to town, preying on unsuspecting travelers and causing trouble for communities, until they are either driven away by organized resistance or the townspeople abandon the settlement out of fear. Bugbear hunting strategies have evolved as they've learned about human emotional responses. Tragically, bugbears have come to relish the great anguish that victims suffer when loved ones perish. One common practice today, for example, involves stealthily abducting their victims' loved ones from their beds without being detected. Typically, the ears of the kidnapped are taken as trophies, while the rest of the remains are left in disarray, on a doorstep or in a barn, only to be discovered after a frantic search of the home. In this way, bugbear raiders are often worse than ogre, hill giant, or troll raiders, since conquest and loot are not the priorities. They instead set out to explicitly create an atmosphere of fear. Although bugbears are loners who travel the wilds in small packs, they can occasionally be seen with other goblinoids. In some cases, a bugbear, being larger and crueler, is able to bully some goblins into his service. Much more common, however, is that they have themselves been bullied into service by the better organized bands and armies of hobgoblins, who find value in directing the bugbear savagery to their own end, employing them as frontline fighters or simply destructive distractions sent before the hordes. Over the thousands of years that bugbears have stalked the wild outskirts of civilized areas, they have evolved a number of specialized subbreeds. Cardan bugbears have dark gray fur and prove far stealthier than their lesser brethren. These bugbears sometimes possess the vexing ability to blend into their surroundings with ease, or even alter their physical appearance to temporarily appear human. Wickawacks are albino bugbears adapted to cold climates, who traverse wintry terrains with ease and leave behind no trace of their passage in the snow. Wickawacks also possess the eerie ability to extinguish fires and lantern lights with but a thought. Meanwhile, garren swamps and tropical waterways are home to the murdered bugbears. These mud-dwelling bugbears can turn into a sludge-like tar at will. In this form, the murd flows through pipes, under doors, and up through cracks in the floor, bypassing barriers and infiltrating homes undetected. In human cities, a new breed of bugbear has emerged, the slate stalker, adept at hunting in the heavily populated regions that humans deem secure. They also possess a horrid power of selective invisibility, in which they are visible only to their victims and unperceived by others. Slate stalkers especially enjoy terrorizing victims, as family and friends look on dumbfounded at their loved one's perceived madness. Finally, the Koblak, the rarest of all bugbears, possess an innate connection to death, as they were birthed stillborn. Yet despite being born dead, a few hours after their emergence into the world, they take a sharp inhalation of breath and return to life. As a result of their half-dead condition, they are seemingly immortal, surviving for centuries, and are among the most powerful varietals of bugbears. Etins. The Etin is certainly a classic D&D monster, and it made its first appearance in the 1977 first edition Monster Manual, described as a nocturnal two-headed giant, a violent and brutish creature that made its home in filthy mountain caves. The etymology of the name Etin stems from Jotun, the Norse word for giant, but the iconic two-headed design of Etins was an innovation on the part of Gary Gygax and his co-creators. It is possible they were inspired by a few examples of two-headed giants that already existed in mythology, such as the myth of Thunderdell, the two-headed giant of Cornwall slain by Jack the Giant Killer in the stories of Benjamin Tabert, who famously said, Fee-fo-fum, I smell the blood of an Englishman. The concept of two-headed giants seems to have been a pretty sticky idea. In World of Warcraft, for example, ogre mages are differentiated from normal ogres by merit of the fact that they always have two heads. In Pathfinder, Etins have the iconic two heads we've come to expect from this creature type. Etins are a subtype of giant, a type that I go into in much more detail in my first creature feature. The prevailing theory of scholars in the game world is that they descended from hill or stone giants. Unlike ogres and trolls, the two other giant types I'll talk about today later in this video, their origins are a lot murkier. The first notable reference of them historically in the lore is ancient Thassalon. As they grew in power, the seven rune lords of ancient Thassalon bred the rune giants, and then used these massive creatures to capture and enslave the giant cultures the Thassalonians shared their ancient world with, especially the stone and hill giants. 
One of the rune lords, the rune lord of Envy, named Bellamarius, who is in fact still alive today, was known to have bred a large number of Etans in her realm, and this is the first moment in the lore that we see the appearance of these creatures. The Etans themselves look similar to both stone and hill giants, but have tusked faces like orcs or ogres. They are, however, taller than both, averaging 13 feet in height, whereas stone giants average 12 feet in height, and hill giants average only 10.5 feet in height. They also don't live as long and aren't very intelligent, with an average lifespan of 75 years and limited mental faculties for comprehending abstract or advanced ideas. Their additional height and mass, their strange two-headed condition, their greatly reduced lifespan and their limited intellect all lead scholars to theorize that the Etans were a manufactured species, possibly bred in captivity, and it may well have been that Bellamarius herself bred the first Etans. They may have been a first draft in the attempts that eventually led to the creation of the first rune giants. Regardless, Etans have since become loners, leading solitary lives, establishing lairs in secluded rocky caves and hollows, often surrounded by pits and trenches. Etans sometimes keep cave bears as pets and guardians for their lairs. Occasionally, Etans are recruited by other more intelligent giant creatures, even including hill giants and ogres who are not too bright themselves. When this occurs, other giants often favor them as guards because their two heads provides them with unparalleled powers of perception. Though Etans aren't very intelligent, they are cunning fighters. They prefer to ambush their victims rather than charge into a fight headlong, but once the battle has started, an Etan fights furiously until all his enemies are dead. Each head is able to exert control independently over one side of the body, allowing them to fight effectively with two weapons at once without any special training. These creatures often prefer flails in combat as they find the thrashing motion particularly satisfying. For Etans, religion, where it exists, tends to be a personal calling. It is not uncommon for them to worship Kochchi, the demon lords of giants Frost and Revenge. Although I have noted that most Etans are solitary, a few do form more sophisticated, smaller communities, and those that do, perhaps unsurprisingly, tend to be among the more intelligent of their kind. Some of those communities have embraced an uncharacteristically introspective and morally neutral faith called the Children of Balance. The Children of Balance is a polytheistic faith that worships a small pantheon of gods whose nature embodies the duality inherent in the Etan experience. These gods include Gosre, the wind and the waves, Nethys, associated with destruction and protection, and Phrasma, associated with life and death. The origins of the Children of Balance are unknown, but their belief suggests an eternal conflict between the cycles of life and death, creation and destruction, growth and decay. The faith warns against the chaos that comes from the veneration of only one of these paired forces and tells cautionary tales of Etans who allowed one personality to dominate the other, leading usually to their own demise. The children believe that embracing both aspects of their respective personalities is the key to survival. The children of balance have one permanent temple, the severed spiral hidden deep in the Astrovian forest in Mendev, but they have small pockets of worshippers among Etan populations throughout the inner sea region, with each group having its own clergy and variation in worship and holy days. The great shaman of the severed spiral is Romrix, an Etan who embodies the dichotomy of the children's faith by possessing both male and female heads. The male head, who answers to Rom, is dedicated to the art of healing, building, and nurturing, while the female counterpart, Rix, revels in destruction, death, and pain. While their personalities would appear to be in opposition, Romrix exhibits no internal conflict. Both heads seem content to share a body with each other. Speaking with Romrex can be a confusing experience as both heads answer questions posed to either, often giving conflicting responses or speaking over one another. Knowles. Unlike some of the other creatures I am covering here today, Knowles appear largely to be an original D&D concept. It has been indicated by some that the name of the Dungeons & Dragons creature was inspired by Lord Dunsany's short story How Nuth Would Have Practiced His Art Upon the Knowles, in which the Knowles in question are little gnome-like creatures that live in the woods. When first introduced in the original Dungeons & Dragons role-playing game in 1974, gnolls were described as a cross between gnomes and trolls, but that was scrapped when the next rules edition came out and was replaced with the more popular hyena man concept in use today. Gnolls and Pathfinder are the second type, humanoid creatures resembling hyenas, characterized by short snouts, sharp teeth, and large, expressive round ears. Their shaggy fur covers their bodies, with a rough texture on their back and softer, lighter fur on their stomach and throat, often in shades of off-white, tan, or brown, with spots and stripes being common. Knolls typically range from six to seven feet in height, with women generally standing taller than men and possessing greater strength. Knolls attain adulthood at 15 and have an average lifespan of about 60 years, although some live to be a 100 or more if they remain in good health. Of all the creature types I'm covering here, the Knolls are the least obviously evil. They are the most communal of the species I'm discussing here as well. Knolls live, work, and fight in groups, 
A lone knoll where they are found is usually the survivor of some calamity, inevitably looking for a new band to join, or as an exile trying to find some other group of humanoids to join with. Strong believers in the power of community, most gnolls cannot comprehend the lure of independence exhibited by other humanoids. That is not to say gnolls do not have individual tastes or desires, but rather that they cannot imagine living alone or without the presence of others nearby. Gnolls can be found in various regions across the world, with each area producing its own unique variations of the species. In the Empire of Thassalon, many of the gnolls in Avistan resided in the domain of Kroon, the rune lord of Sloth, where their lackadaisical nature was encouraged, and they served as scouts and forward observers for the army. However, after Thassalon's downfall, the Noel population in Varicia was severely reduced, with most fleeing the region out of fear. Nowadays, the majority of Noels in Avistan live in subterranean areas, or in the forests of Rizmiran, the river kingdoms Kionin and Galt. In Garand, the Noels of Assyrian, Katapesh, and the sandy desert climes tend to be semi-nomadic raiders and slavers. The desert-raiding gnolls often move between trading routes, attacking caravans for food and, more crucially, water. Prior to the great cataclysm that created the mana wastes, gnolls lived in great numbers in the region currently occupied by Geb and Nex. However, with the magical destruction that ensued from the two nations, gnolls were forced to flee the area. The ones that remained became known as the Crocotans, which still pose a threat to the region. Others migrated south to the Jaja plains beneath Geb. You can see more about the Knoll history of the Mwangi Knolls in my last video, the regional deep dive on the southern Mwangi expanse. The Mwangi Knolls, also known as the Kolo, prioritize practicality and efficiency in their hunting and raiding. Honor is considered unnecessary risk-taking, as any loss affects not just the individual, but also the pack and kin. Knolls consider effectiveness as a virtue and prioritize victory above all else, whether it involves mercy or cruelty. They believe that the best fight is one in which the opponent has no chance to strike back, and they excel at ambushes, feints, and psychological warfare, though their tactics make them unpopular among their neighbors. The Knolls' practice of ancestor worship and endo-cannibalism is also misunderstood. They consume their dead as a sign of respect, holding a grand feast and transforming their bones into art or weapons. They extend this honor to respected foes, hoping to bring their enemy's strength or cunning into their own clan. Kolo gnolls live in clans comprising 10 to 20 interrelated family groups, totaling between 100 to 200 individuals. The clan is governed by a council of female gnolls, chosen from the eldest members of each family. The council elects a chief elder, who acts as the first among equals and sets the agenda. The council also receives guidance from the clan's bonekeeper and storyteller, two positions of significance in gnoll society. The bonekeeper's responsibility includes tending to the desires of gnoll ancestors and gods, they are named after the ancestral bones that decorate their garments and homes. Storytellers act as teachers and sages, and are expected to possess extensive knowledge of clan history, local lore, and anything else that might be relevant to the clan, often speaking multiple languages. Kolo women usually serve as hunters, warriors, and leaders, while men take on roles as artisans, caretakers, and gatherers. However, adherence to gender roles varies among clans. Male and female gnolls may become bone keepers or storytellers, and these positions frequently serve as avenues to power for male gnolls. In most parts of the world, the gnolls' religion revolves around the worship of Lamashtu, and female gnolls are often given a choice between becoming mothers or clerics of Lamashtu. Those who have not chosen either option are sometimes sacrificed on their 15th birthday for the lack of commitment to the clan. Female clerics of Lamashtu perform ritualistic duties such as the overseeing of births, enforcing spiritual laws, and officiating deaths. Male gnolls do not become clerics of Lamashtu, but may become shamans instead. Male shamans perform day-to-day -day religious duties such as blessing food and providing healing. Clerics are identified by the gashes in their bellies, which they ritualistically self-inflict in honor of the Mother of Nightmares. Shamans of Lamashtu instead practice a grotesque ritual called Rafgar Hartaf, or growing the third eye, which involves piercing their forehead to hang the eyeball of a humanoid victim as a divine focus for channeling Lamashtu's magic. In addition to their worship of Lamashtu, gnolls have a secular and superstitious fascination with the moon, which influences their daily activities. Not every gnoll community is committed to the worship of Lamashtu above all other gods, and the most notable exception is once again among the Kolo of the Mwangi Expanse. The majority of Kolo pay respects to Calistria and Shailin, who are regarded as the elder and younger sisters, representing both strength and beauty. Nethys, known as the Brother, is the god of choice for bone keepers, while Lamashtu, who is revered in almost all other Knoll communities, is invoked as the Old Mother, in times of dire need only, and is otherwise avoided at all costs. In Pathfinder 2nd Edition, the Kolo Knolls in particular are considered an uncommon player character ancestry, and an increasing number of Knolls have shown their quality as adventurers in the Mwangi Expanse, and elsewhere beyond that as well. Despite that, 
Just as with playing a goblin, orc, or other monstrous creature in most so-called civilized lands, gnolls may be attacked on sight, and their kind are not readily welcomed. Beyond clan and cultural differences between gnoll groups, there is also one known subtype of gnoll. Fiercer, larger, and more intelligent than the rest of their gnoll kin, a gnoll flind will often ascend to leadership positions in their pack. The gnolls look up to them as younger siblings due to their older brothers. Due to unknown reasons, flins are almost always infertile, resulting in a low population. However, the rare flins who are able to reproduce enjoy great influence in their pack, almost at the level of the chieftain. Flins typically live among their gnoll relatives and are nearly indistinguishable to those unfamiliar with the two races, except for their larger size, as the biggest gnolls and smallest flins are of similar stature. Harpy Harpies come to us from Greek mythology. In Greek mythology, harpies were born of Thaumas, a minor sea god, and Electra, a sea nymph. The harpies of Greek myths seem originally to have been wind spirits, and were seen to be personifications of the destructive nature of wind. Their name means snatchers, or swift robbers, and they were said to steal food from their victims while they were eating, and had the responsibility of carrying evildoers, especially those who had killed their families, to the Irenes, the Greek Furies, typically three chthonic goddesses of vengeance. When a person suddenly disappeared from the earth, it was said that he had been carried off by the harpies. Some sources portrayed the harpies as beautiful winged women, but other sources, typically later sources, described them as ugly, more savage creatures, possibly to differentiate them from the more beautiful sirens. In Pathfinder, harpies are vile and cunning creatures, and like hags, they are an all-female species. They are avian creatures that possess wings, claws, and feathers, and often have soft down covering their bodies, but otherwise are humanoid in appearance. Their feather patterns vary based on the local bird life, with some resembling birds of prey and others resembling scavenger birds like vultures. While their faces may appear human at first glance, a closer look reveals sharp teeth and predatory eyes. Harpies are generally slender, and they have hollow bones to reduce their overall weight and allow them to fly better. They have surprisingly large wingspans to help keep them aloft as well, but they can tuck their wings fairly discreetly and may be able to pass for humans or elven women in bad light or in elaborate costumes. However, their feral faces, clawed limbs, and in some cases, their smell may give them away when their prey is close enough. Harpies have a similar lifespan to humans, but few among their own kind live to old age. Harpies take pleasure in the pain and suffering of others, and make no effort to hide their sadistic nature. Even if they have reason to be friendly, they will flaunt their wickedness and keep score for later. Harpies have a natural talent for understanding the minds of others, and combined with their ability to emit a captivating song that entrances others, they make excellent torturers and spies. While they are sometimes employed by more powerful evil creatures for these purposes, most harpies live in small tribes or family groups and prey on the outskirts of civilization. They will eat almost any creature, but prefer to prey on sentient beings, so they typically haunt trade routes and other areas where they can find fresh victims. Harpies that live in harpy communities are also recognized for the bad smell of their environs, as they have a tendency to leave out the remains of their victims, and their nests are often grimy, soiled, guano-covered things. In areas where harpies are common, they are well known for the danger they pose to people and property. Children are warned to avoid areas with a stench of refuse or rot, and never stray too far from home. Harpies can be found throughout the inner sea region and beyond, although they are believed to have originated in Iblidos and other eastern areas. They are highly adaptable and can thrive in warm or temperate regions, but they dislike the cold and are rarely seen north of Varicia. Harpies prefer to live in wilderness areas with inadequate governance, such as the western coast of Garand and various mountain ranges around the inner sea, rather than highly built-up areas. This is because harpies are creatures of the open skies and don't like to keep low profiles, making it rare to find them layering in cities. The Pact Masters of Katapesh don't exert much effort beyond the cities, so harpies often prey on outlying communities and trade caravans with relative impunity in that area. When attacking caravans, they usually target the slaves first, since Katapeshi traders view lost slaves as a mere cost of doing business. In fact, to make their more important slaves less attractive, some traders passing through harpy territory display some of their less expensive slaves decked out in shiny but cheap jewelry. Desert harpies across Garand have been known to migrate between different layers according to the trading seasons, leaving many caves in the southern deserts filled with harpy waste. In Avistan, harpies are most common in Varicia, where the lack of a centralized government and large stretches of unclaimed territory makes it easier for them to prey on small communities. Hell knights stationed in Corvosa have a policy of using overwhelming force against harpies, so they tend to stay away from that area. However, harpies can be found in significant numbers around Magnamar and the coastal swamps, as well as the Storval Rise, where they layer in caves on enormous cliffs or venture inland to prey on the occasional Shawanti. Varician harpies are especially fond of Thessalonian ruins, where they foul the high nooks of ancient towers and colossal statues.
Some experts suggest that their captivating song ability comes from their advanced sense of empathy, which allows them to sense and share the emotions of others. However, their empathic abilities have become twisted over time, leading them to enjoy the fear and pain of sentient creatures and the panic of unintelligent animals. Harpies' favorite meal is humans or elves, but they will settle for almost any humanoid. Even though goblin meat doesn't taste good to them, goblins make for easy victims, and the fear that goblins exhibit is almost irresistible to most harpies. Even if they live in an area where preferred foods are plentiful, they also hunt goblins for sport, as tormenting goblins is highly satisfying to them. Goblins are so terrified of harpies, in fact, that savvy rangers will often wear a harpy musk when moving through territories known to be infested with the little creatures, as the odor of a harpy will actually be enough to keep most goblins at bay. Harpies reproduce by mating with humanoid males, since there are no male harpies. But unlike hags who do the same thing, harpies have a more limited range of humanoid types with whom they are compatible. Harpies most commonly capture humans or elves and force their cooperation in the act through the use of their siren song. Some harpy stock have been known to descend from orcs or half-orcs as well. One rare, larger breed of harpy found in the Isles of the Shackles have survived by procreating with the cyclops descendants of the Gulgan, and are notable because, like the creatures they were able to breed with, they now also have only a single eye. The males selected for reproduction are not so lucky, since they are often immediately devoured after copulation. Harpies tend to choose physically strong and aggressive males as genetic donors, with warriors being preferred over farmers, artisans, and magic users. The perceived value of having a strong mate is so strong that harpies occasionally mate with impressive orc or human males even if they cannot eat them afterwards, but only if the benefit of bearing their progeny outweighs the shame of not devouring their mate. Harpies can be charming, but never sweet when courting such a mate. Those who accept such dalliances are often extreme thrill-seekers or masochistic deviants. The harpies' need for other humanoids to procreate with means they cannot stray away from civilized lands entirely and their presence in the deep wilderness can indicate a hidden indigenous tribe or isolated village. Harpies' offspring are born with the ability to chew and partially digest meat. However, they are often too weak to rip it off a carcass, so their mothers rip the victims into bite-sized chunks before feeding them to their young. Harpy mothers have a duty to care for their young until they can fend for themselves. If the mother dies, the entire tribe shares the responsibility of caring for the offspring. Harpies that live near human settlements may moderate their predations to avoid being driven off by locals. They are adept at calculating how many victims to take to avoid drawing attention from the authorities. Harpies preying on trade routes also use similar strategies to avoid armed expeditions to their areas. They avoid confrontations with more powerful forces and may migrate elsewhere rather than fight to the death. Harpies are known to worship a range of evil gods and demon lords, including Lamashtu, Norgorber, and the infernal Duke Alakur but they most frequently worship Pazuzu, the demon lord of winged creatures, and their haunts typically have an elaborate shrine to him. These shrines are decorated with the severed tongues and eyes from the harpy's victims, and are often used for conducting mating rituals. As Pazuzu is also the king of wind demons, harpy colonies sometimes engage in a religious ritual that involves flying recklessly in an ecstatic dance during violent windstorms. Clerics of Pazuzu are often among the higher-ranking members of harpy tribal communities. Harpy social structure can be chaotic, but there is always a pecking order to their tribes. Higher-ranking harpies are often brought down by their social inferiors, who then fight among themselves for power. Adventurers may find it useful to parley with a harpy and offer a chance at betrayal and advancement to distract and neutralize a flock. Minotaurs The Minotaur is a creature that comes from Greek mythology. The original Minotaur descended from the Greek nymph goddess Pasiphae, who became a queen when she married King Minos of Crete. Poseidon punished Pasiphae and Minos when they did not offer him the appropriate sacrifices for his gifts, forcing Pasiphae to lay with the snow-white bull that they had spared. The resulting creature was called the Minotaur, a horrible, violent creature half-man and half-bull. Because Queen Pasiphae could not bring herself to kill her own child, she had the great inventor Daedalus build an unsolvable labyrinth beneath the city, and place the Minotaur there where it could roam at its pleasure. In time, Minos and Pasiphae came to use the Minotaur and the Labyrinth as a place to send condemned prisoners. One day, Androgeus, son of King Minos, died, and the fault lay with his Athenian guests. The Athenian prince Theseus volunteered to intercede on behalf of the accused Athenians and descend into the Labyrinth in their stead. Before he descended, however, Minos's daughter Ariadne fell madly in love with him because of his bravery and helped him navigate the labyrinth. In most accounts, she gave him a ball of thread, allowing him to retrace his path. According to various classical sources and representations, Theseus killed the Minotaur, either with his bare hands or sometimes with a club or sword. The Pathfinder version of these creatures draws from this essential root mythology. 
The minotaurs stand approximately eight feet tall and weigh about 600 pounds. They possess the torsos and arms of powerfully built humans, but with a thick, shaggy brown fur. They possess a snarling bull's head with a pair of forward-thrusting horns. Due to their bovine head, minotaurs tend to communicate with great many snorts, rumbles, and snarls, using the lips and tongues of a cow. They also have a two-foot-long tail, covered in brown fur with coarse black hair at the end. Their legs are enveloped in a longer fur and terminate in great cloven hooves. Legend has it that minotaurs are infamous for their grudges, which they hold for centuries, for they are an exceptionally long-lived creature type. Once scorned by civilized societies, minotaurs now take revenge on unsuspecting victims. The mere thought of an encounter with a minotaur is enough to strike fear in the hearts of many, as death is a more desirable fate than becoming the creature's next meal. Minotaurs are often associated with mazes, but in reality, they are just as comfortable in any complex underground network of tunnels and chambers, be it a sewer or cave system. The more intricate, the better, as it allows them to navigate with ease while their prey struggles. They take pleasure in stalking their victims and revel in their attempts to escape. The real hunt only begins when despair sets in, and they can finally pick off their prey one by one. The last victim is allowed to escape to tell the tale and lure in the next unsuspecting meal. In battle, few can match the ferocity of a minotaur once it is provoked. These bull-headed creatures are prone to fits of rage, tearing apart their enemies and anything in their path until they finally calm down. However, some minotaurs may be open to peaceful interactions for those who show them proper respect. Rumors suggest that some even offer aid and advice, but the truth is that minotaurs are a blend of savage beast and civilized man in constant conflict. While the beast usually reigns supreme, the man sometimes gains control, if only briefly. Those who seek the counsel of a minotaur should beware, as the price of their help often comes at great cost. The minotaur is a creature that has a strong attachment to its home, spending a lot of time maintaining and expanding its maze when not hunting or baiting prey. Since their prey often becomes frustrated in the twisting corridors and dead-end chambers, the minotaur must constantly repair damage and lay false trails to keep them disoriented. While most prefer to live in stone environments, they are intelligent creatures with intricate minds, and some use plants, wood, or even worked metal to build their labyrinths. They may also set sophisticated traps and use surprisingly complicated trigger devices such as elaborate crossbows or ballistas. Though minotaurs can be solitary creatures, some choose instead to live in a tribe. Those who wish to join a tribe must typically bring an improvement or innovation to the maze as a gift. The existing clan members will judge the gift, and those deemed worthy are made part of the tribe through a communal hunt. Status in minotaur society is derived from prestige and battle prowess, and members of a tribe compete with one another through races and competitions to see who can claim the most victims in a limited time period. Elderly minotaurs, who can still hunt and aid the community, are respected and used to plan raids and organize the defenses of the maze. Those who cannot hunt are given the title of builder and are in charge of designing the expansion of the maze and its many traps. No tribe allows more than one builder, however, and when another elder desires the position, the two must fight, with the loser being slain or exiled. Minotaurs rarely have relations with any other civilized species, and view humans, elves, and dwarves as cruel imperialists deserving a little more than winding up on their dinner plate. Conversely, these races typically view minotaurs as horrid monsters. While a minotaur might free a captive in exchange for services, this relationship is coerced through fear and threats. Sometimes, minotaurs do enter into arrangements for as long as they remain beneficial to them, usually involving eliminating an individual or small group in exchange for treasure or sacrifice. Minotaurs may ally themselves with other powerful creatures such as medusas, rakshasas, or giants. Such alliances are held together through the power of the partner, and minotaurs dislike following the orders of others, sometimes turning on their allies over the merest slight. According to Minotaur legend, the first of the minotaurs, Baphomet, was born on Iblidos, an island nation in an archipelago off the coast of Kasmarin in the Abari Ocean, and came to be as the result of one of Lamashtu's vile acts. In life, Baphomet fathered numerous minotaurs, and led his people to secret places all across Galarian. When he died, Lamashtu took his soul and transformed him from petitioner to her handcrafted consort. More details are provided on Baphomet and Lamashtu in my series of videos on the Infernal Gods. Because of these legends, Baphomet and Lamashtu are the most commonly worshipped gods among minotaurs, with Lamashtu edging out Baphomet as the eldest and more powerful deity. Minotaurs who take the cleric class almost exclusively choose Lamashtu as their patron, although it's not unheard of for some nihilistic minotaur clerics to serve Rovagag as well. There is a subtype of minotaur known as the ghost bull. These rare albino minotaurs tend towards being sorcerers instead of barbarians, rangers, or clerics, and these are the most likely to follow the path of Baphomet, who is, among other things, a master of dark sorcery. Ogres. Ogres share the same root etymology as Orca does, as described in my ancestry guide video on orcs. It comes to us from the French ogre, 
first used in Perrault's 1697 book Comte, and likely was a French dialectical variant of the Italian orco, meaning demon or monster, which in turn derived from the Latin orcus or Hades. In classic role-playing game tradition, the ogre is a larger creature than the orc, but usually not as large as a giant. In Pathfinder, ogres are a scourge upon the world. Their mere presence brings horror, and they have been a persistent threat to human kingdoms since ancient times. Their reputation as legendary abominations is so terrifying that even those who have never seen them fear them. They are the monstrous hybrid children of giants and smaller humanoids, typically humans or orcs. As hybrids of mortal men and giants, most ogres stand two to three feet taller than humans and a couple of feet shorter than the average hill giant not unlike the height of a hill giant guff. See my giant creature feature for more details. However, that's only an average, and one of the unique features of ogre kind is their seemingly endless and ravenous appetite, which at a certain acquisition of physical bulk will start to grow them in all sorts of ways. The greatest among their kind top at at a terrifying 14 feet in height, and a well-fed ogre's mass can reach a staggering 2,000 pounds. Ogres are gluttonous and lazy, often eating themselves into a stupor when victims are abundant. In fact, the ogre appetite is truly legendary. An ogre can survive off any food, even consuming tree barks or hardened bone if necessary, although it always prefers the still warm flesh of humans and their related kindreds whenever possible. Most ogres are woolly brutes, their chests like dark forests, and their arms matted with sweaty swaths of black or brown hair. Their heads are flat and most of their noses pug. Ogres' eyes tend to be too small for their bloated faces, hiding in the folds of their sloping fleshy brows. Freakishly hardy, Ogres develop faster than most other creatures, topping out in height and girth at only six years of age. Females keep steady supplies of young coming to replace the ones murdered by their jealous siblings, beaten to death by their male kin, or slain by the arrows of humans and elves. Most ogres' lives are cut short by violence long before nature takes its course, and one who reaches thirty is considered a wizened elder. Like the hill giants they descend from, ogres frequently breed kin to kin and favor large families. Their bloodlines sullied by incest, these monstrosities are cursed by the gods with hideous deformities and madness beyond measure. They are further encouraged to do this through worship of Hagakal, the patron god of ogres, who is reputed to be in a state of constant coupling with his twin sister. More details on Hagakal can be found in my giant pantheon video. The most terrifying thing about ogre kind is their malignant sense of humor. What men call horror launches ogres into fits of oafish laughter. Ogres convulse with laughter at the sight of a person's limbs being torn apart, or their back being broken. They revel in evil torments and lusty exertions, finding no appreciation for anything beyond wholesale murder and the taste of living flesh. While they view all smaller beings as insignificant and worthy of tormenting, they do fear larger creatures, and so are sometimes kept in line by other evil giants. Although they are skilled at basic tool and weapon making, they are often too unruly to be suitable as minions for greater villains, unless under constant threat of extreme violence. Ogres have a fondness for wild parties. They construct massive bonfires and dance frenziedly around them until the wee hours of the morning. One of their favorite dances is the skull jig, where they adorn themselves with their preferred skulls, which clatter as they leap and prance about in an obscene manner. Music might soothe others, but it riles up ogres. They enjoy dissonant noise and love to bellow out their jibberjaw songs while they are dancing. They also take pleasure in coercing prisoners into singing, grunting, yowling tunes by means that are often brutal and vulgar. Ogres will sometimes hold such a party in advance of a raid to psych themselves up for more violence. When enraged or on the hunt, few things in the world are more terrifying than a charging ogre. For some of the other creatures I am covering here today, I have a list of known subbreeds, but for ogres, the number of subbreeds are too numerous to name. As a result of inbreeding, various tribes have evolved with unique genetic distinctions. For example, the Thickens of northern Varicia have gigantically oversized heads and huge mouths with extra sharp teeth. The Pickens tribe of the River Kingdoms grow tall and lean like dead trees, and their fingers end in sharp bony protrusions. The Chagras of forested Malthoon are covered in dark fur and reek of musk, so they can suffocate their foes by simply holding them close to their bodies. Other tribes inbreed with such tenacity and enthusiasm that their already fragile gene pool buckles under the strain. Over time, these degenerate ogres turn feral, losing their mind and developing grossly bulging limbs and distorted torsos. They rarely survive longer than a few more generations once their bloodline degenerates to this point, but these psychotic monstrosities always wreak plenty of terror on nearby populaces before they die out. As mentioned, ogres are the degenerate descendants of crossbred men and giants. Some ogres, especially the larger ones, consider it a sign of great virtue to take a full-blood giant for a mate. 
But ogres themselves are not mere half-giants. They have long since become their own breed of being, with unique physiological characteristics, such as their endless hunger and their ability to carry enormous amounts of weight. Their massive progeny, therefore, known as the giant kin ogres, especially if they are crossed with larger giants like frost or fire giants, are often just as large as their giant parents, but can grow fat and bulky as their ogre parent. Due to greater gene pool diversity, they also tend to be more intelligent than their more inbred smaller cousins. Not surprisingly, giant kin ogres who live among ogre tribes invariably grow up to be tribal leaders, soon far outstripping the capabilities of those around them, but still retaining the malicious sense of humor that makes ogres so terrible to deal with. There is a final type of ogre that I'll touch on briefly. Primarily found in the realms of Tianxia are the Oni, a family of fiends who dwell primarily on the material plane rather than in the outer sphere, and have adapted to the material world of Galarian by taking on humanoid forms. One of the most common kinds of oni are the onidoshi, who have taken the form of, you guessed it, ogres. The onidoshi are so common, they are sometimes simply called ogre mages, and in Tianxia, clans of ogres can sometimes be found to be ruled over by an ogre mage. However, it's worth noting that the ogre mages are not true ogres, they are demonic, extraplanar entities who have taken the form of an ogre. My last note on ogres is to point out something that's a personal observation I made while doing this research, so I'm drifting slightly beyond canon here. Several people in the comments have asked me about half-giants in Pathfinder, and that technically doesn't exist in the game as either an optional ancestry or as a creature type in the bestiary, for either edition of the game in fact, at least as of this recording. That said, ogres were originally half-giants, half-human and half-giant, but inbreeding led them to becoming the degenerate creatures we know today. One could argue that a half-giant, i.e. a direct descendant of a human and a giant, could in fact be considered a true ogre. And we know that even though rules don't exist for this creature in the game, they certainly exist because otherwise we wouldn't have gotten regular ogres. It could even be that these beings are the ones whose form the Oni stole when they became the first ogre mages, as most modern ogres are too inbred to have a form worth copying. Also, there is the curious fact that the Tan Zodiac sign of the ogre describes him as a benevolent protector, meaning that there is the potential for some version of ogres to exist out there that radically differ from the norms I've described here. I point all of this out because I know a lot of people love the idea of half-giants and will be homebrewing rules to support such creatures, and I figured I'd offer some connective tissue between your homebrew options and official Pathfinder canon for you to play with. Sahagans. This next creature type differs from the previous ones I have discussed because they don't come from classical mythology. However, they have certainly become modern classics, and I feel hard-pressed to come up with any aquatic encounter in Pathfinder where these creatures don't show up. Although they don't stem from classical antiquity, breeds of fish people can be found in the more modern classic mythology of H.P. Lovecraft in works like The Shadow Over Innsmouth. Aquatic fish people have also been present since the very first version of Dungeons & Dragons, where they were called gogglers, fishmen, or the Koa Toa. Finally, this creature type has been used extensively in video games, and the 15 million players who played World of Warcraft at its height all surely have deeply imprinted on them the terrible sound the murlocs make when you ride your mount a little too close to a shoreline or river. <laughs> Sahagan appear as some sort of cross between a fish and a humanoid. While their frame is much in common with humans, having two arms and two legs, they also boast a tail that ends in a fish-like fin to help propel them through the water. A Sahagan's head is clearly piscine, with a mouth that gapes like a fish, but it is filled with sharp, flesh-rending teeth. They also typically grow to larger size than most humans, with large Sahagan capping out at around seven feet in height. The Zahagan are horrid creatures that lurk in the oceans, ever ready to wreak devastation. These sea devils leave ships adrift and crewless, steal away whole villages in the dead of night, and force aquatic elves and merfolk alike to gird for war. Zahagan are complex beings. They have keen intellects and crave order and structure, yet they boil with barely suppressed rage and bloodlust. Even the smallest provocation can tip a Zahagan from cold and calculated schemer to murderous assailant. To stay sane and sharp in times of need, Sahagan periodically revel in blood-stained waters. As a people, Sahagan seek nothing less than total dominion of the seas. Though they love to unleash doom on other intelligent species, Sahagan also live in perpetual war with their own kind. Their kings and queens encourage these petty blood feuds, seeing them as a means to feed the blood frenzy, control their numbers, and further hone their race's already considerable skill in battle. Unlike most aquatic humanoids, Sahagan thrive at any depth or temperature. Even still, they show a marked preference for warm coastal waters, perhaps due to an abundance of both food and beings to terrorize. Sahagan can be found anywhere from sheltered atolls to lightless trenches, from the tropics to the poles. They have even spread to the elemental plane of water. 
Sahagan live under a feudal system that embodies a ruthless enforcement of order. Each Sahagan holds a position earned with its prowess and skills, and risks demotion by showing any signs of incompetence. Officers and lords rule minor holdings as vassals to the barons, dukes, and princesses. Kings and queens rule entire oceans from their grand palaces within cities boasting populations in the tens of thousands. Each noble Sahagan aspires to bend the others to her will, and become the ruler of an oceanic empire, ushering in the inevitable age of Sahagan ascendance. Despite their use of noble titles, Sahagan put little stock in bloodlines. Accomplishment trumps parentage, and while Sahagans take pride in relatives with influence and strength, even the offspring of royals must swim unaided. Certainly those children have more opportunities in training than others, but the ambitious daughter of a common laborer might rise to rule a barony, while the inept son of a baron could very well become the meal of his betters. Sahagan view other creatures through the lens of their appetites. Other races live only to serve as slaves, to die in sport or battle, or to fill the belly. Sahagan rarely ally with creatures other than their beloved sharks and the shark-like Adaros, though they occasionally enslave dragon turtles and other fearsome aquatic monsters as beasts of war. They despise aquatic elves, locathas, merfolk, and tritons, seeing them as weaklings fit only for slavery and feasting. Aboliths and krakens are in a mixture of loathing and respect, as these beings represent the greatest impediment to Sahagan domination of the seas. Young Sahagans are born into clutches of up to 200 eggs, which females lay in well-protected chambers. A single settlement typically is one chamber, but larger cities can have up to a dozen. Eggs hatch three months after being laid, spawning eel-like fingerlings, all teeth, jaws, and tail. Hatching provokes a violent frenzy as the newborn fingerlings devour the smaller and weaker members of their clutch. A number of the survivors fall prey to larger predators or are eaten by their larger siblings when they grow hungry. Only the clever, fast, or strong survive long in the egg chambers. Sahagan parents return to claim their surviving young after a year has passed, recognizing their offspring by scent. Some young remain unclaimed because their parents either have perished or cannot be tracked down. The Sahagan barracks raise such foundlings communally, thrusting them into battle as soon as they can wield a trident. Sahagans mature quickly. They develop arms and legs at six months of age, grow to around five feet tall within a year, and reach their adult size of seven feet around their sixth year. Upon reaching maturity, Sahagan of low social standing must fend for themselves or die. Those of higher status are often trained and protected long enough by their parents to become skilled and deadly warriors. As a species, Sahagan are particularly prone to mutation. Most mutants perish in the hatcheries, but those that survive command early respect, their strange abilities seen as proof of divine favor. The most common are the fearsome four-armed Sahagan, perhaps accounting for one in a hundred surviving hatchlings. Other mutations appear to arise due to environmental conditions or nearness to other species, or perhaps in response to trace contaminants in the water. Of particular note are the Malenti, those Sahagan who for unknown reasons are born looking exactly like aquatic elves. Trolls. Trolls originate with Nordic folklore and Norse mythology, and are described in Old Norse sources as living in remote areas such as rocks, mountains, or caves. Unlike the more solitary beings of Norse folklore, trolls had some social organization and were said to live in small family units. There are numerous tales about trolls in which they are depicted as very old, physically strong, but mentally slow, and sometimes even as man-eaters. Some tales report that they turn to stone when exposed to sunlight. Later sources recount how trolls display a habit of bergtagning, kidnapping, or more literally, mountain-taking, and that their communities were also known to invade farms or estates. In Pathfinder, as with most giant types, all roads lead back to the stone giants. Trolls somehow descend from them, either directly or more likely as a genetic offshoot of the hill giants. Although trolls are more intelligent than hill giants, much more similar in intellect to stone giants who have human levels of acumen. However, they are shorter than stone giants, with the larger females averaging 10 to 11 feet, similar in height to hill giants, and with the males averaging only 8 feet, closer in height to an ogre than even a hill or stone giant. Their intelligence and smaller size, however, are not their most unique features. The thing that sets them apart from either of their forebears is their ability to regenerate damage from nearly any injury. How or when the trolls evolve this ability is lost to time, but it makes them extraordinarily difficult to kill, and therefore makes them among the more dangerous types of giants that one might encounter in the wild. Male trolls view themselves as the apex predators and rule their hunting grounds with brutal force, and their preference for a solitary lifestyle leads them to seek out larger and more rewarding hunting grounds deep in the wild. Female trolls, on the other hand, see themselves as protectors and respond with equal violence to any perceived threat to their young. Despite their reputation as unstoppable monsters, trolls have a complex social order and a caring system for raising their children. Female trolls travel in wandering groups, raising and teaching their young to fight and hunt. In contrast, males are solitary and wanderlust afflicted. 
If a male comes of age and for some reason resists his urge to roam, he is often forcefully ejected from the group by his mother, or the group matriarch, sometimes even killed outright, all in an effort to protect the young. It's these starving, restless males that sometimes stumble upon farmsteads or attack rural communities, sparking myths of terrifying trolls that come in the night. Though rare, encounters between civilized human societies and trolls are fear-inducing and breed animosity. Trolls are formidable fighters. When provoked, they puff out their chests, stretch their massive arms, and bellow ear-piercing challenges. Despite their size, trolls are alarmingly fast and they are quick to aggression too. Trolls possess an ability to regenerate damage almost instantaneously, allowing them to fearlessly explore the wilds and attack any perceived threats without hesitation. Trolls have two development phases. As younglings, male and female trolls learn to hunt and fight together. But once they reach maturity, everything changes. Adult female trolls will emit a scent that attracts adult males from up to 50 miles away. The males must prove their dominance to the females, and only the strongest is allowed to breed. But after the breeding event, the male must flee or face possible death at the hands of the larger female. Adult males have a savage hunger and may on occasion attack and eat troll younglings, causing female groups to eject them when they reach full maturity around the age of 15. Female trolls breed only once and give birth to sets of younglings, typically two to three, but sometimes as many as five. A newborn troll weighs around 50 pounds and stands about three feet tall, with a strong instinct to kill and hunt from day one. Although stories of small trolls attacking or stealing livestock seem like a fanciful farmer's tale, it's plausible for a newborn troll to venture out on its own to seek food, and this might explain why these stories are so common in rural areas. In troll culture, weakness has no place in a troll group, and as nurturing and kind as the troll mothers can be to their children, a deformed or weak youngling is destroyed without a glimmer of remorse. Despite their powerful regeneration ability, trolls are not immortal. Trolls are still subject to some of the risks that humans are. They can be killed by viruses that inhibit their regenerative abilities. They need oxygen so they can asphyxiate or drown. Starvation can also end a troll's life. A full-grown adult troll needs up to half its own body weight in food every day. After only a few days without sufficient food, a troll's regenerative abilities cease to function. Once it loses its regeneration, a troll quickly succumbs to starvation or other natural hazards. Finally, and most crucially for adventurers traveling through troll territory, fire and acid also inhibit a troll from regenerating. Male trolls typically prefer living in caves or heavily forested areas with dense vegetation. They may construct makeshift dwellings using salvaged materials like wood and metal, and occasionally even reside under bridges or cliff ledges. These dwellings serve primarily as places to consume their prey away from the elements. Female trolls, on the other hand, may use captured tents or carts filled with wood to build rough structures to house their young. While trolls are capable of surviving extreme weather conditions, they prefer shelter to avoid discomfort caused by hail, snow, and rain. Interactions between trolls and other species are rare occurrences. Occasionally, female trolls will trade captured goods and wealth to gnolls in exchange for their slaves, which the trolls then consume. In addition, some troll tribes have formed alliances with ettins and hill giants to protect their hunting grounds. On occasion, individual male trolls may serve as guards and enforcers for gnoll bands in exchange for food, but these are exceptions to the troll way of life. Trolls view any creature that enters their territory as a threat, but ogres are viewed as doubly dangerous. A lone ogre wandering into a male troll's hunting ground or crossing the path of a female group is a sign of impending disaster. Ogres are simple-minded creatures that often kill for sport as well as food, and a large ogre tribe can wipe out an entire region's food supply, leading to starvation and extinction for resident trolls. Trolls have learned to immediately destroy ogres and their outposts upon discovery. Male trolls repeatedly attack ogre enclaves, retreating only when wounded, but returning immediately after regeneration to attack again. Ogres lack the intelligence to effectively defend themselves against troll assaults, and even a single troll can seem like a hundred when it flees a bloody mess and returns fully recovered just ten minutes later. Ogres even scare their own children with tales of massive troll armies waiting to destroy ogre kind, and if trolls had armies, they would gladly fulfill those nightmares. Despite the fact that many trolls are wandering loners, they have a pretty consistent set of religious beliefs, which curiously center around enduring great suffering. Trolls believe in a cruel god named Urxahal, who they say created the world and populated it with trolls. According to their belief system, Urxahal constantly infests their hunting ground with ogres and trespassing humans and subjects them to seasonal storms and roaring forest fires, which trolls fear above all else. They also believe that Urxahal, they also believe that Urxahal granted them the power of regeneration to survive his trials so that they may continue to be brutalized. Female troll groups participate in a game on spring solstice to honor Urxahal. Two groups of trolls stand several yards apart, staring at each other until they become consumed with aggression and hatred. 
One troll from either group charges at the other, triggering a chaotic melee in which limbs are severed, bodies torn apart, and eyes gouged out. Fortunately, trolls regenerate, and in due time, all the bloody injuries will heal completely, and the trolls can return to their routine business. There are many subspecies of trolls found across Galarian as well. Two-headed trolls, thought to be troll relatives of Etans, can be found in various parts of the world, some even adhering to the Children of Balance faith I described earlier. Frost and ice trolls have pale blue skin and ice-like claws and teeth. They are somewhat slighter in frame than other trolls, and are typically only found in the cold northern climates. Ice trolls are more social than their temperate cousins, and form larger settlements, sometimes living alongside frost giants as well. In the nation of Irisen, frost trolls even control one of the larger Iriseni cities, a city called Three Trolls at the Verge province. These trolls will use weapons and armor, a habit not shared by many other troll breeds, who are quite content to fight with tooth and claw. Moss trolls are found in the deepest equatorial jungles of Galarian, and are said to be an ancient cousin of the modern troll long thought to be extinct. They stand a foot shorter than most other troll breeds, their bodies are shaped like green jungle foliage, and their eyes are hidden beneath a heavy brow and thick, bushy green eyebrows. They live in pods ranging from six to a hundred individuals. In the past, moss trolls were the dominant species in the world's temperate and tropical forests and jungles, but their numbers have declined, and they are now prey to larger and faster creatures in the humid rainforests of Galarian. Rock trolls are a larger variant of trolls, with their bodies fused with granite, diamond shards, and iron veins. It is believed rock trolls were created as a result of experiments by dark wizards or alchemists, and that secret blood magic and alchemy was used to enhance their regenerative powers, harden their skin, and increase their speed. However, this has produced a dangerous side effect. Exposure to sunlight can trigger the production of a toxic hormone that sends rock trolls into a hallucinatory trance, slowing them down and eventually immobilizing them. Only when the sunlight fades and the hormone production stops can the rock trolls move again. Prolonged exposure to sunlight can permanently petrify this type of troll. Scrags are aquatic trolls, typically freshwater creatures living in rivers and lakes. Scrags have an amphibious physiology, requiring them to breathe air, but relying on complete submersion in water to activate their regenerative abilities. These creatures rapidly lose vitality when removed from their aquatic environment, becoming lethargic and disoriented before ultimately perishing if not resubmerged. Though they share a hunched, thin appearance with their troll relatives, scrags possess green slippery skin and rows of sharp defensive spines along their back. They are avid thieves, driven to collect shiny things, which they hoard beneath the surface of their home rivers or lakes, and they are known to ambush passing caravans or fishermen in order to acquire desired treasures. Finally, there is a troll nation as well, the Mistshaper Trolls. The largest tribe of trolls in Galarian live in southern Vudra, far east of Avistan. Zel Nud, a massive female troll, rules the tribe with an iron fist, standing two feet taller and weighing almost twice as much as any other troll in her tribe. It is rumored that she made a deal with the demon god Urxahal to achieve her mutated size and power. Zel Nud's leadership style does not tolerate dissent, and she brutally punishes any troll who opposes her. Her fanaticism and belief in herself as Urxahal's agent have led her to plan for the destruction of civilization and the restoration of a dark, brutal state similar to the Age of Darkness. While her goal may seem impossible, her megalomania could have dire consequences for the people of Vudra and the surrounding nations. Thank you so much for watching. Hopefully you got some value out of that. If you enjoyed this content, please let me know in the comments below. If you enjoyed this channel overall, please be sure to like and subscribe. I'll see you next week.